In our time, in our day and age, a lot of <coughs> methods are used in sharing the gospel. There are a variety of messages that are used. Um, a lot of different emphases. Maybe the emphasis is escape the judgment that's to come in hell. Or do you want to get to heaven? Let's go to heaven. Get to heaven. Or join God's family. Just, just come join God's family. You can be a child of the king. There are even those that combine Christianity with wealth and prosperity. Become a Christian and all of this that you see will be yours as well. As a pastor of a church plant, there's a subtle pressure for us to make a convert, to make converts and to have a baptism, to get credential, to move from being just a church plant to being a credential church. And if we're not careful, we can be tempted to use <coughs> methods or to change the message in a way that we will get a positive response from the gospel. Somebody to pray a prayer or to say, I'll follow Jesus. But how should we share the gospel? Well, that's the subject of today's sermon. How should we share the gospel? Our text is Mark 4. We're in Mark 4, and we've been going through Mark these last uh, couple months. And as we look at this parable, this is one of the first teachings of Jesus that's in the book of Mark. Up till now, we've seen Jesus do some things. We've seen him heal. We've seen him. We've heard that he's teaching the crowds. We've heard that people are following him out to the Sea of Galilee, up in the mountain, down in the water, out to, his, out to Peter's house. We've heard about his teaching, but we haven't actually seen or read much of his teaching so far. So in this passage, Mark gives us the parable of the soils. And in this passage, in addition to just this teaching, we kind of get to see backstage, we get the curtain opened up as Jesus takes his disciples somewhere and he gives them the meaning of this parable. And beyond that, he talks about parables in general and he talks about the disciples and he kind of prepares them as they're going to share the gospel when he leaves. So in Mark 4, what I want you to kind of think about is what is it that is the same in all of these scenarios that we come across? What's the same? What is it that's different in these scenarios? And then we're going to talk about an application of, of how that applies to us, particularly in sharing the gospel. So if you would, as we are accustomed to standing for the reading of God's word, this is a longer passage, but if you're able to stand, stand with me. Read Mark 4, 1 through 20. The word of the Lord. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into the boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path. The birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns. The thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil, producing grain, growing up, increasing and yielding thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear let him hear. When he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you it has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. 
When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that's sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. They have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall off. And others are the ones sown among thorns. There are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. But those who were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word, accept it, bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, this is a familiar passage. And sometimes those are the hardest to preach. Everybody's heard them. You have your perspectives and your ideas on this or what you think that, that this means. So we're going to dig in. In fact, we're going to be in this passage this week and next week. And um, as, I, as I went through this, I thought, oh, this is going to be a slam dunk. You know, the, the soils, yeah, easy. Jesus even explains it. But there's so much here. Uh, but we're going to look first this week at what's the same, what's different, and then an application for, gospel, for the gospel. So we see here, Jesus is talking, let's get a little more context. Some of you may not have been here the last couple weeks. So last week in Mark 3, Jesus can, is confronted by some scribes that have come all the way up from Jerusalem. And what do they claim? They claim two things about Jesus. Let's see if you remember last week's sermon. I don't remember what I ate yesterday sometimes, but what was last week's sermon? What were the two things that they claimed Jesus had or did or was? Demon possessed, that he he was he had Beelzebub. He did this by Beelzebub, that he was demon possessed. And secondly, it was the power of Satan that he was basically like a sorcerer conjuring up, and that that was the power that gave him the ability to heal people. And Jesus said to him, "What what what sense does that make? Why would Satan fight against himself first of all?" And then second of all, he said, you know what? You have seen the power of God. You have experienced the power of the Holy Spirit through me. You know that this is of God, and yet you deny it. And not only deny it, but you're attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to the work of Satan. I mean, it's one thing not to believe. It's another thing to say that what this is is not only not of God, but it's of Satan. And that's what these people were saying. They had been around long enough to Jesus, with Jesus. They had seen all of these miracles, and it just didn't fit for them. They thought there's no way that Jesus could be of God because he's questioning us. He's challenging us. He doesn't do things the way that we would do them. He doesn't follow the traditions that we have. And their only solution was that Jesus wasn't of God. Well, if he's not of God and he's doing things supernaturally... That supernatural power has to be of Satan. And so they attribute it to Satan. And Jesus says some pretty harsh things. In 329, he says, Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. In other words, he's saying, You men here, and we talked about this last week, because they were so confronted with the Holy Spirit in a way and saw Jesus in person doing this work and yet attributed this to Satan. Jesus says, you're, you've committed a sin. You're, you're at a point where it's, you're, you're done. This is an eternal sin. You have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. And he says, you will not be forgiven this sin. So now Jesus is by the sea again. And we, we read a couple weeks ago that he told his disciples to get a boat ready because he didn't want to be crushed by the crowd coming in. And we didn't see him get in that boat the last time, but this time we do. So many people come around, he gets in the boat, and they, they float the boat out a little bit so that he can talk to everyone. <clears throat> and, and that's where we are now. He's teaching them. This passage is important for a variety of reasons. It's, it's important because of the content, 
This is in all three of the Gospels. You see this in Matthew 13, 3. You see it in, here in Mark 4 and in Luke 8, 5. All three of the Synoptic Gospels have this sower, the, the parable of the seeds, or some people call it the parable of the sower. You'll see why I'm calling it the parable of the seeds here in a minute. I mean, sorry, the parable of the soils uh, in a minute. It's important because of the passage. It's, it's, it's important of the content. We get to understand not just this parable, but Jesus is going to unlock what all parables are doing, what he's doing through the parables. But this is a shift in Jesus' teaching. Up until now, he has preached the gospel to everyone. He has, he has said openly and clearly what they need to do. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, that he is the Son of God. It's been declared by the Father. Mark has told us already in chapter 1 that Jesus, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then the Father, when Jesus was baptized, proclaimed, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then we've seen the demons shout out, what do you have to do with us, Jesus, Son of God? So God, Mark's given his testimony god and now the demons as well we've seen that jesus is the son of god but now we have a shift he just told these guys you are committing an eternal sin by not believing in the work that i'm doing by saying that the holy spirit is actually satan and the work that i have for you you are committing an eternal sin and now we have a shift <clears throat> we have this shift now and this parable is actually a parable of judgment it, the, jesus speaks other parables that instruct us that tell us what to do but this parable in addition to the instruction does have a piece of judgment almost continuing the phrases that he's taught he's told these scribes that had attributed his work to satan and then Mark puts this, it's in the middle of his Galilean section. Remember we said there are three sections that we have here in Mark. This first section is his ministry in Galilee. And midway through, in this section, comes this parable right in the middle. And it's the first teaching that we have of Jesus. So, it's an important time in Jesus' ministry. Mark strategically places it here in the gospel, and it's in all the gospels. What is a parable? What is a parable? Like an oval shape. That's parabola. Yeah, parabola. I am a math teacher, but we're not going to do more parabolas. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Okay. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Um, earthly story kind of emphasizes that it's something that we, we know that's familiar with us. It, it's a narrative or a saying of varying length. And it is. Kevin's right. It's, it's something that we can relate to that uses earthly things like people or situations or scenarios. And, and it's probably not something that actually happened. A, a parable is something, it's an example of telling you about something that, that had happened. And it's designed to illustrate a truth, especially through comparison or simile. In other words, you, you hear a story about something, and from that story, there's something else that's there. It's, it's, it's almost like a riddle that there's a deeper meaning. Um, one of the commentators says it's like a political cartoon. You can see a political cartoon in a magazine or a newspaper, and everyone can look at that and say, okay, this is an animal sitting on a chair holding a stick. You're like, okay, I get that. There's an animal sitting on a chair holding a stick, but it has some other meaning. It has a deeper meaning, or it has a more pointed meaning to us. That's what Jesus does with these things. These parabolas, uh, parables, you got me saying parables. These parables, parables are clear. And when you read it, everyone can kind of look at it and go, I get it. I get what's going on here. But there's a deeper meaning that is almost hidden. And it's not so much a riddle that's hard to understand. It's not like this is math. This isn't calculus. This isn't something that Jesus is putting out there that's like, you really got to work hard to figure out the meaning. No, it's something that's hidden. 
Maybe instead of saying a riddle, it's really, it's a hidden meaning. But once you get it, once you see it, it, it's not hard to understand. The meaning's clear. Have you ever used those little mind benders? My, my cousin that was here last week came and brought the kids all these little puzzles. They're all the metal works that you have to get them open up. You know, I just pull them hard enough until they break and then they open up and I solved it. But there is a way to spin them right and get it out of it. And that's kind of the thing. It's, 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 it's hidden, but once you know the secret to it, how to unlock it, you can lock it back up, unlock it, lock it back up easily. Unless you broke it when you pulled it apart. That's what we have here. So let's look at this parable. And let's see what is the same in all of these parables. The first scenario. Um, well, what is the same in all of them, actually? What's, what's the same in all of these? Well, in all of these, you have what's called the sower. The sower. And we see in his explanation, what is the sower really doing? The sower, this isn't about seed. This is an agrarian society that would have understood this right away. Like, okay, yeah, I get it. A sower throws seed on the path, throws seed on rocky ground, throws seed on thorns, and now throws it on good ground. I get that. But what's this really mean? The sower is the person sharing the gospel. Up to now, that person has been Jesus in the gospel of Mark. But it's going to be the disciples. Jesus is preparing them because they are going to be the sowers. But now it's you. It's me. We, it's his I. We are the sowers. We are the ones who are sharing the gospel. But you see, the sower is the same in all of these situations. It's not that one sower did this and this result came and then a different sower did this. And this, no, and in fact, we don't even get one adjective about the sower. It wasn't a savvy sower. It wasn't a uh, hip sower. It wasn't a strategic wise sower. We just get that there's a sower sowing seed. In all of the situations, it's the same sower sowing the seed. In addition to the sower being the same, the method seems to be the same in all of the situations. He casts the seed, the sower casts the seed in all the different areas. It's the same. So the sower maybe isn't that important, or if, if he is, he's just not described, but it's the same sower, and the method is the same in all the situations. We have different outcomes in all of these soils, but there's the same method and the same Soil. And then what is the what is the sower throwing? The seed. But what is the seed? It's the gospel. It's the word. The word of God. It's the gospel. So the sower is the person sharing the word of God. Does the seed change? Does he use a certain seed here, a different seed here, a better seed for this one? No, it's the same message in all the cases. And so we see that the sower is the same. The method is the same. And the message is the same. In all of these scenarios, in all three or all four of the soils, that has not changed. And here's the point that I'm making. It doesn't matter, really, who sows. It doesn't matter if the sower has a seminary degree or if the sower just became a Christian, the parable doesn't focus on the sower other than to say that he is sowing. He's telling other people about the gospel. The methods are the same. He sows the seed. He casts it on the ground. And the message of the gospel does not change. It is the same in all of the situations. And the implication is for you and for me that you and I we really don't affect the outcome of evangelism. The focus isn't on me as the sower. And we don't have to change our method. And we definitely don't need to change the message of the gospel as we look at different people and as we talk to them. Those things do not change. 
And changing those things will not necessarily change the response of the person. Despite the same sower, the same method, the same seed, we have four different outcomes of the soil. So what is that determining factor? What is the difference then if that's not the sower or the seed or the method? What is the determining factor in the outcomes? Well... If we look at the Luke passage, Luke 8, 12, he says kind of more clearly that what the soil is, is the heart of the recipient. The difference of the outcomes is that the soils are different. And really what we're saying here is the preparation of the people's hearts. The preparations are different. That's the difference in the four scenarios. And that's why we get a difference. That's it. Not the sower, not the message, the seed, and not the method, but the preparation of the heart. So let's look at the preparation of the heart. The first heart. We see that's on a path. Let's look down to Jesus' explanation in verse 15. These are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes takes away the word that's sown in them. Now, we've all, we've all been on a path. Is a path the place that you're going to plant your garden? <laughs> no, because, well, one, people are going to walk on it if it's a path, but two, it's hard. It, it has been just pushed down. We went hiking at, at uh, Dallas Creek down there State Park yesterday, and there's, there's dirt because it's been wet, there's mud all around, but you know what? It didn't matter that it rained on the path because the path didn't get muddy. It's so packed down and hard. It's, it's almost like, like, like a stone. And we're on this path, and it's dry, and it's hard, it's arid, and anything that drops on it just bounces off of it, doesn't penetrate it. This is the heart of a person that when you share the gospel, it hits like a rock. And it just seems to bounce off. Doesn't penetrate that person's heart one bit. Have you ever talked to somebody like that? You share the gospel with them and they, they are just clearly not receiving the word that you're sharing them. And they're saying to you, no, I don't believe. They may even come out and say it. I don't believe in what you're saying. I believe it's wrong. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in the Bible. And antagonistic, they might even come after you and attack you because their heart is so hard, like a hard path. And that seed comes, and as soon as it's, it's there, it goes away. And Jesus says that Satan comes and pulls it away. Now, and we'll talk about this more next week, but that person's heart that's hard right now God can take that heart and can make it into one of the other soils, can even make it into the good soil that is a soft heart, right? What did God say? The prophets said he would take hearts of stone and he would give them a heart of flesh, take out the heart of stone, give them a heart of flesh that would receive the word. And that's what God has to do for us to receive the word. But until he does, we, have, we can have a heart of stone. We he do have a heart of stone. And that seed just hits it and goes away. I think Jesus is, is preparing the disciples for some failure. Not, not everybody is going to just hear the word and go, Oh, yes, I'm in. I'll follow Jesus. Yes, I'm there. No. There will be people who when you encounter, he's telling the disciples, you're going to tell them the gospel and they're going to have a hard heart and the, the, the word is not going to penetrate it and they may even come after you. And we've seen that. We've seen that as these scribes and Pharisees and he may even have these same exact people in mind. They've come after you. They, remember what happened in chapter 3, early in chapter 3? They started to conspire with the Herodians how to destroy Jesus because they don't believe him and they're going to come after him. That's the hard heart. 
but only God can do a work in that person's heart to prepare the soil for them to receive. And we don't know what we're going to get. When we go to somebody, we don't know if we're going to get the soil, number one, this path that we share the word and it just comes out. Our job is to be the sower and to sow that word, to share the gospel. But you're going to share the gospel with people, be encouraged, that will not believe it. They'll not listen to you, and it will be apparent very quickly that their heart is not receptive to the gospel. But we still need to express that. Give them the opportunity and share the gospel with them. The second heart that we see here is the rocky soil. And that's verse 16. These are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. They have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Now the guy that I mentioned at the beginning is in this category. Yeah, I'll take, I'll take with joy. This sounds great. I respond to the gospel with joy, with emotion. I was like, this is wonderful. And then as soon as things get hard, it steps out for Christ and they get tribulation or you know, trials or something gets tough, they take off, they leave. It, it, it's not true Christianity. It's not true faith. And we'll talk about what's missing here in a little bit. Why does that sprout up? Why, when it's on a rock, why does it sprout up? Because it can't go down, right? So instead of roots going down, the sprout comes up. And it looks like, oh, there's growth. Look at this. But there has nothing to, to harness into, and it withers away. And Jesus said, this is like the one when trials and tribulations and persecution come. They, they go away. If we don't tell people about the trials, about the tribulation, about the difficulty that's going to come as their Christian life proceeds and progresses, we're doing them a disservice. We're giving them part of the gospel, but we're not giving them the whole gospel. We're giving them something that's catered to getting an emotional response, but really doesn't change their heart and really doesn't result in transformation and true belief and true faith. I, I baptized Zach. Tavawatch Park, and we were finishing up, and we had about 20, I don't know, 20, 30 people with us, and it was cold, wasn't it, Zach? It was cold. I had waiters from Nolan, but you were cold, and uh, we got out of this cold water, and really nobody was in the water. It was still a pretty cold time in spring, and this guy goes, hey, did you tell him the whole story? I said, I don't know I baptized him. I mean, like, what are you talking about? No, did you tell him the whole story? That's going to be hard. It's not just all easy, right? Did you tell him? I was like, well, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I told him the whole story, yeah. And, and, uh, and his point was, you, you can't just make this appeal for the gospel and just say, come to Jesus, do you want heaven? Everything's great, get away from sin. No, you have to, it, that's not how Jesus did it. He told them everything. He said, you want to come after me? Take up your cross and come follow me. And later they understood clearly what that meant. Take up your cross means to, to, to die to yourself. Die to your passions. Die to your desires, to your control, to your own authority. And submit yourself to the God of the universe and accept what Jesus did on the cross. Yes, he did the work. But it comes with giving him everything and it, and and part of the part and parcel is trial tribulation and difficulty in the christian life in this world while we're still in this world and if we don't tell people that we're not telling them the whole story we're not telling them everything and when it comes you know all that's going to happen is when when tribulation and trials come and they're just going to say this christianity thing doesn't work it doesn't work i tried it it doesn't work. Well, maybe what you were presented as Christianity doesn't work. 
But trusting in the God of the universe, in Jesus Christ who died for our sins, having the Holy Spirit come and indwell us and strengthen us and empower us to endure any trials and persecutions that come along, that does work. It works so that you can even have joy in the midst of your trials. Not happiness and giddiness and, and a, a blithe spirit, but joy, deep contentment and joy, knowing that you have God with you while you're walking through a valley. Jesus said it best in Matthew 16, 24. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That is not just the call for discipleship, church. That is the call to come to Christ. There's not like this green beret discipleship level of Christianity where you deny yourself and you die to yourself, then you get into this discipleship level. No, that's what he says, come. If you want to become a Christian, you give up your life. That's, that's the call. Come and die so that you might live. Paul and Barnabas, Acts 14.21 they preached the gospel to the city. They made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples. Now get this. So Paul's going around all these churches. He, he told them the whole story. They saw the story in him. He even says, you know it's going to be tough because you see what I'm going through. I'm getting persecuted. I'm, I was stoned. I'm getting followed. I'm getting harassed. Same thing's going to happen to you. But it says he's encouraging them strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Maybe you, maybe you haven't heard this before. You're like, wait, I didn't know this was part of the deal. This is part of the deal. This is the deal. Come and die. But you know what? So worth it. So worth it. And Jesus uses this analogy later. A seed, unless a seed dies, it, it can't become what it was meant to become. Unless we die to ourselves, we can't have that new life in Christ in this world and in the next. So worth it. The gospel has to start with the perfection and the holiness of God. If we don't emphasize the perfection and the holiness of God, that he is our creator, that he is fully holy and perfect and good, and then the darkness and incompatibility of our sin in the presence of God, if we don't put those two things together, that's not the gospel. If you're not explaining to people how amazingly other than we are, God is, and how we have sinned and how our sin puts us in a position where we are not able to be with God. We're incompatible. And not only that, we are deserving of judgment and the wrath of God. That's not the gospel. Unless your gospel includes Jesus paying the penalty for our sins and that his payment is sufficient for us and that we need no other work to earn or to reckon us with the Father, but that we must repent. Loathe our sin, turn to God, and give him everything we have and we are, and all we hope to be, that's not the gospel. This person receives the gospel with joy, but that's not the mark of a true believer. What's the mark of a true believer? What shows that there's true faith? Repentance. Repentance, a mourning of sin, a, a, a hatred of sin. In themselves. When you see somebody, you share the gospel, and they are just overwhelmed with their own sin, then that's the work of God in them. Just someone having joy at this message and receiving it with joy may or may not mean that they're a believer in Jesus Christ. The true mark of a Christian in biblical faith is repentance. Repentance. We're taking time before you join the church, for you to write out your testimony, for you to explain 
uh, how you have come to Christ to understand this, to see this, to flesh it out, to explain it. Because if you just say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, and I say, come on in, great. And you're not really a believer in Jesus Christ. You came with joy without seeing tribulation. Tribulation comes and you turn and you leave the faith. You're not really in the fold. Many people in churches are in there because the bar is so low and they haven't been told the whole gospel, and they have joined the club for the benefits without making the membership fee of sacrificing their whole life and putting it on the altar and being ready to undergo trials and tribulations for Jesus Christ. There's no way for me to hold, fully know your heart where you are as a Christian, but we can take time to go through steps to make sure that when we have people join the church, we believe to our best of our ability, you are really a believer in Jesus Christ and you understand what it means to be a Christian. Same goes for baptism. They used to have a, when Christianity started out, it was amazing, right? We read Acts, thousands in one day, not more thousands. It's like they're just, this tidal wave of the move of the Spirit of God. What happens? It gets pretty attractive. And by 100, 200 AD, people were wanting to join Christianity for all the benefits, to be part of the family, to be part of this love feast, to be part of communion. That get, Hey, I have a need. You're going to help me meet my need as I'm in the fellowship. That's awesome. Well, they started having catechumen classes. And they would, they would have baptisms at Easter because people would go for, for months through these classes and they would endure as a candidate for baptism and they would go under examination and they would go in to see when trials came, did they, would come, did, would they continue in their faith or would they move off? they go off, okay, they're not going to be baptized. They're not true believers. They've gone away. So we take, we take some time with that because it would be a travesty for us to confirm someone, baptize them, join the church, tell them you're a Christian when they're really not and they're unaware of that situation. And the flip side of that, if someone really is a Christian but we're taking time, what's the danger in that? They're taking more time to, con to consider that and shore that up. So this person receives with joy and they go away. The third, and we're only going to have time for the third one. We're not even going to get into the fourth soil. The third is storms choke it out. Verse 19 says, But the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires of other things, enter in, choke out the word, and prove it unfruitful. The cares of the world, the lure of money, the desire for these things prove the gospel to be unfruitful. But is the gospel the problem? No. No. This seed is not the problem. God's word is not the problem here. The problem is the soil. This person's heart is so attached to the things of the world. Money, possessions, position, that it chokes the word out. Doesn't allow the word to grow. And this person results in not producing any grain. The gospel is unfruitful, but not because it's not the right gospel. Because of the heart. This person wants to keep one foot in the world while they put one foot into Christianity, and this is no Christian at all. The gospel also involves telling people they must give up everything, their lives, their possessions, their worldly possessions to follow Jesus. My favorite parable in this, is Matthew 13, 45. It's the parable of the pearl. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all he had to buy it. And I heard Tommy Nelson preach an analogy of this, and it was just amazing, so I've used it a ton. Man walks into a store, and he's walking around, and he looks, and he sees this pearl, and he is just captivated by this pearl. He's got to have it. He goes up to the man. And he says, how much is this pearl? 
that says, oh, you, you know, this is a pearl of great price. You, you don't, I don't think you really even want to know how much it costs. He goes, no, I do. I, I need this. I have to have this pearl. And he says, well, how much money do you have? He's like, what do you mean how much money do I have? I'm asking you how much it costs. He said, I'm asking you how much you have. And he tells him how much is in his bank accounts. Is that all you got? Well, I've got some retirement accounts. Okay, how much would those be worth if you cash those out? He, he writes all that out. He goes, okay, I saw you. You didn't walk in here, did you? No, I saw you had a car. How much is that car worth? I don't know if I sold it. Maybe worth this much. He writes that out. He goes, okay. He goes, all the money in your bank accounts, all your retirement and your car. He goes, do you live in a tent? No, I have a house. He goes, well, how much is the house worth? He goes, come on. I'm, I'm going to give you all my money, all my retirement, and my car. And he turns around and walks out. But as he's walking out, he looks back at that pearl. And the pearl is so precious. He's, it's worth it to him. He says, I've got to have it. He goes back. He says, okay, my house is worth this much. Here you go. He goes, all right. I'm going to need you. I'm going to need your time, too. I'm going to need your time and your talent, uh, your abilities. I'm going to need that too. He said, and are you married? Yeah. So I'm going to need your family. They're going to be mine too. I'm going to need you to give me your time, your talents, your family, your relationships. And he says, you've already got all my money, all my time, all of my talents, my family. So he says, okay. He says, I'll give you everything. He signs over everything, his self, his time, his family, his, his belongings. And the man gives him the pearl. And as he's walking out, he has the pearl. And he says, wait a minute. He goes, no, you can't have it back. He says, I'll never ask for it back. He said, but come here. Here's the keys to your car back. Here's the deed to your house back. Here's your family back. Here's your time Here's your talents back. Here's all your money back. Here's your retirement back. He goes, I want you to remember that it's mine. And that if I ever ask for it, that you're willing to give it to me. But that pearl is yours. The pearl of great price is yours. That's what it's like to come to Christ. We give him everything. Because he deserves it. And he's worthy of it. And at any time, we have to remember that it's his. And he could call it from us. That's the gospel. The result of the gospel is not dependent upon me. The message doesn't change. It's the heart of the individual. Some may be hard path that bounces off. Some may be receive it with joy, but they take off when the tribulation comes. Some may have an emotional response. That's why we don't preach to emotion. We don't use emotion to get an appeal to get a response from someone. We speak and preach to the mind. We share the whole gospel without embellishment and we be prepared for either immediate rejection or someone to fall away or possibly rejection because of the world's devotion. But there's also the good soil, which we'll look at next week. And be encouraged. And we never make an emotional appeal. We never put out the perks without telling the whole gospel. That's what we're called to do as a sower. Sow the seed. 